Hope Cook with Dermcast Live. Today I have Dr. Markowitz here. Dr. Markowitz's motto says it all, cutting edge without the cutting. Welcome Dr. Markowitz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you again. Me too. So the world of melanoma diagnosis and treatment has changed so much. Can you tell us what is the latest with the mRNA vaccine that I've heard about? Yeah. Um, so I, I think I first just want to agree that, you know, given when I started practicing uh, dermatology, which was a few years ago, yeah. um, I, you know, we had basically no treatments for advanced melanoma. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the offering now for patients with advanced disease and uh, the fact that recently um, we were able to say that even patients with stage 2B melanoma um, should be potentially offered adjuvant therapy yeah. like mRNA vaccines. So the mRNA vaccines, we're familiar with them obviously now because of COVID and mm -hmm. the whole concept of, you know, how do you create a vaccine more rapidly and also that you can be more targeted with the proteins that you want the vaccine to kind of target. Um, and now we, I think April 2023 mm -hmm. uh, was the most recent that I can think of um, trial showing evidence that if you combine an mRNA vaccine with immune therapy and perhaps even with targeted therapy, but this trial was looking at immune therapy, that you're going to substantially, like, what, like close to, mm -hmm. like not that much less than 50% decrease um, in mortality with these advanced melanoma patients, right? I think it was like 44%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty impactful. That's pretty exciting yeah. to have these kinds of outside the box, in a sense, offerings mm -hmm. that are probably going to become the standard, you know, neo, well, actually adjuvant uh, mm -hmm. care. Yeah. yeah, and 2B, that's exciting. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, previously you had to be much more advanced to be mm -hmm. offered adjuvant therapy because when you're offering things to very advanced melanoma patients, it's almost like, let's just throw everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah. But then when you're showing that there is clear proof that patients are improving, you're going to obviously start to, and, and that the side effect profile for a vaccine is really not so substantial, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you offer it to patients with less advanced disease mm -hmm. that you're trying to make sure have yeah. a better long-term outcome? And for providers who are excited about this, is this already available or is it still in the clinical trial phase? Um, well, I guess the question is, you know, are people offering vaccines as part of their yeah, can you clinical practice? And I think the answer is um, that most therapies for advanced melanoma patients are going to be offered by people like oncologists mm -hmm. or that, you know, are highly specialized in treating advanced mm -hmm. patients. And so often that does become either like a standard offering or part of a trial. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is something available to patients, but uh, you know, most advanced melanoma patients are not gonna be treated in a general derm mm -hmm. practice. Right. So we wouldn't be offering it to them even if it is mm -hmm. something that's commercially available. So for us, it doesn't really make a difference in a sense, whether mm -hmm. it's through a clinical trial or commercially available. Um, but I'm, I believe it's still, you know, kind of in the early stages of understanding mm -hmm. the benefits and also wanting to combine with perhaps, you mm -hmm. know, we, we have so much uh, information with immune therapy, but now we have all these targeted therapies yeah. and better ways to, to look at, you know, the different genetic profiles of the tumors mm -hmm. within a patient, right? And so now we should probably be looking at mm -hmm. whether this benefits targeted therapy as well. And so my guess is there'll just be more clinical trials available mm -hmm. with adjuvant, these newer adjuvant therapies. Yeah. yeah. It's an exciting time. Very. And can you talk a little bit about targeted therapy versus immunotherapy? Right. So with immunotherapy, you're, you're kind of targeting 
the immune system's response mm -hmm. in killing tumor cells through these cytotoxic T cells, and um, and you get uh, you know more of a prolonged effect, but you're also going to have potentially adverse reactions that are irreversible. Mm -hmm. With targeted therapy, it's very tumor dependent on what you know, potential ge genetic makeup or what they're looking at as a somatic um, gene uh, profile. And so, yes, you're going to get a much more rapid response. Mm -hmm. If you stop the therapy, those, you know, significant adverse reactions are pretty much reversible. Um, but you're, you, you may not get as long lasting a response, mm. but it's nice. And you don't have as many clinical, you don't have as many trials because it's a newer, you know, of some of these genes we're just discovering. Um, and by we, I don't mean me, right. uh, a, a practicing, you know, uh, dermatologist who's looking at, um, you know, early diagnosis, mm -hmm. but within our the specialty of oncology and melanoma management and uh, and therefore we need to probably be doing more trials now using targeted therapy in combination and seeing obviously how how much we can lower the mortality of our melanoma patients and back in the day the prognosis was if you were greater than a millimeter in thickness yeah. right like more than what like a maybe like two millimeters or more like the tip of a crayon yeah. or whatever that you were basically, you know, your five-year survival rate was ridiculously, mm -hmm. you know, non-existent. And now it's, it, the, we can't even, I don't even mm -hmm. know what the survival rates are, which is good. It yeah. means that people are surviving. Yes. Yeah. A and you mentioned that we're not doing, we're not deciding whether they need targeted therapy or immunotherapy. We're referring them to oncologists. But it's important <clears throat> that when we're doing that, and we're looking to see who do we want to refer to mm -hmm. and which centers and perhaps, you know, do we advise a patient to go an extra hour out of their way? And right. if we're not paying attention and we're not looking at, for example, clinicaltrials.gov to see, wait a minute, an hour and a half from here, we have a, a site that has like this really exciting mm -hmm. clinical trial with, you know, good results and they're already like at the next phase of treatment. And so I kind of feel like when you're providing care, you need to really be the advocate for your patient mm -hmm. and not put it all on them to kind of figure out what's their best next step. Mm -hmm. And it may not always be the person right next door. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure they're overwhelmed and by looking at clinicaltrials.gov, it at least gives them some direction they yes, could go. That's right. So you mentioned that there are non-invasive treatments for stage zero melanomas. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so that's what I specialize mm -hmm. in is looking at lesions non-invasively and potentially even offering non-invasive management. Is this something that I'm massively advertising? Perhaps not, mm -hmm. because I don't want patients to think, oh, I have a melanoma, right. therefore I don't, you know, nobody wants surgery, nobody wants advanced therapies, mm -hmm. but they're often life-saving. So the gold standard is still going to be following, you know, the staging protocols and surgery, but with lentigo maligna, mm -hmm. which are basically you know, head and neck um, tumors, uh, melanomas that by definition are stage zero and also are a different category, right? Mm -hmm. These are in older patients. Um, they arise from chronic sun exposure, so not so much the intermittent vacationer sun mm -hmm. exposure types. And they tend to have a better profile in terms of survival. Um, studies in Australia where they don't have the same access to managing melanoma mm -hmm. patients and care that we do here, although they're getting a lot better with a lot of different programs that they're implementing. But because of that, they've done studies where they've observed patients for X number of years with lentigo maligna, and their survival rates on observing alone are quite high. Mm. So being able to then perhaps offer someone who may have like a silver dollar size lesion in the middle of their face, right. or I, I treated a patient who had um, a melanoma in situ right here, and in order to remove a lesion right here, you know, with a one centimeter yeah. margin, or, I mean, 
it's like it's almost impossible, yeah. right, without massively mm -hmm. um, changing the appearance of one's face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's great to have these options. You also mentioned the sticker. Can you explain for new providers what this is? And Yes, um, so when we're looking at things non-invasively, um, non-invasive basically means non-cutting. Mm -hmm. So we are using our eyes, that's a non-invasive way to look at someone. We're using a dermatoscope, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can use confocal microscopy, which is a device that does a non-invasive biopsy. Um, those are all the tools that I'm kind of utilizing if, for example, I'm managing a melanoma non-invasively. If we want to diagnose, we're also going to use our eyes, dermoscopy, mm -hmm. and then smart sticker technology where you're literally using a piece of tape mm -hmm. on a lesion. You're not cutting it, you're not manipulating it, and then you're sending it through the lab um, to get genetic profiling. Um, the specificity is still not as high, mm -hmm. meaning if it comes back positive, it may not be a melanoma. Um, but of course, if you're cutting everything, then you're going to have a great um, specific, uh, sensitivity and a very low specificity. So it's probably higher than if we're, you know, having a tendency to cut mm -hmm. it anyway. Um, but the sensitivity is 99%. So if it comes back negative, that's very reassuring that we don't have to cut biopsy that lesion, but we still should probably monitor it, right? Mm -hmm. Because things do evolve. Yeah, do you yeah. use that more on young people or certain body parts? Um, so I use it when I'm short-term mole monitoring a patient. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's every age group. If I see an atypical mole um, and I, I know that if I biopsy it, the pathologist is gonna call it most likely mm -hmm. dysplastic and I'm gonna need to do a conservative re-excision and that patient's gonna end up with a big scar, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna offer short-term mole monitoring, which is with dermoscopy, and I'm gonna offer smart sticker if the lesion is large enough. It has to be at least three millimeters in diameter. And I'm gonna offer that in my patients if they don't have an obvious malignant feature. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at a lesion and I see some features that I know are very consistent with early melanoma, such as, for example, peppering or regression, then I'm likely not going to not cut the lesion mm -hmm. or at least offer a non-cutting biopsy and perhaps then a more, t you know, more specific how I'm going to cut the lesion um, mm -hmm. for diagnosis. So, gotcha. um, but yes, if I have patients with uh, a referral of a lesion on a face, for mm -hmm. example, then I'm much more inclined to try to do everything non-invasive possible mm -hmm. before I'm cutting like a large pigmented lesion. And most lentigo malignas tend to be caught when the lesion is substantial on a face because if you look at the dermoscopic features, they're very subtle. Mm -hmm. So it's very tricky and not often with dermoscopy are we able to catch these lesions when they're really mm -hmm. tiny and given the cosmetic outcome on a face of a large lesion and then a large excision which is what you need to do for melanoma it's pretty substantial so mm -hmm. it's helpful to have as many tools as possible to catch it early yeah how often do you do your short-term follow-ups um, so short-term mole monitoring when it's on the body mm -hmm. the recommendation is in three months Okay. Uh, and a patient, if they don't come in, in my practice, gets an automatic recall message that mm -hmm. says you have not come in. Therefore, the recommendation is that you go and get this biopsied. You really okay. have to, like patients, pe um, providers are a little nervous to say, well, what if they don't come in or whatever? So mm -hmm. you have to have that right. sort of recall system built in. That's very important. And you have to have a trust between you and the patient. Otherwise, you biopsy the lesion. That makes sense. Um, if it's on a face, because lentigo maligna is such a slow growing, slowly evolving, I actually have to do it at six months. Three mm -hmm. months is too soon. Or I can have them come at three months, but I also would need to watch it at six months because they, you, you again, don't always catch it mm -hmm. within that first three months. But um, on the body, that's like, what, like at least a 93% specificity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really high. Um, so it's good, to, it's good to have that combined 
now with smart stickers. So you mm -hmm. have high sensitivity, high specific, you, you know, so everybody's being followed at the right protocol. Yeah. You mentioned Lentigo Malignas, um, which made me think of your laser advice. Can you share yes. with our listeners when yeah. patients come in for brown spots, what do you need to be aware of? Right, so I feel like today patients have so many options mm -hmm. in terms of getting you know, their freckles and lentigines treated with chemical peels, lasers. Mm -hmm. There's so many med spas now that are utilizing various devices to eradicate things and tattoo removal spas mm -hmm. and it's the same technology now Your for- Your dentist. You know, exactly. <laughs> So your, what, what makes us so important as providers and why are we part of this picture regardless of where the patient is going and opting to get these things done is to remind our patients that if you are planning to do this, um, you need to have me take a look mm -hmm. and make sure that you're not going and, and treating melanoma for two reasons. One is that, um, well, I mean, basically, I get these patients. They get referred to me, and they come from all sorts of locations and very, uh, very well recognized um, providers, as mm -hmm. well as med spas, etc. And they say, "Go see her. This lesion is resistant to laser treatment." And then you ask the patient, "Oh, how long have you, you know, have they been trying?" And it's like a year or two years, and now you have this large lentigo mm -hmm. maligna that you're managing and then it's like who's to, it becomes the blame game. Mm -hmm. Was it a melanoma? Probably, you know, and you don't, so, so we don't wanna do that for our own patients, mm -hmm. but we also wanna advise our patients, but really we're the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. right? If we're examining patients, we are the gatekeepers, not just for advanced therapy or which oncologist to go to or what mm -hmm. clinical trial might be the best one for them for their stage of disease, but we're the gatekeeper to say, if you decide, you know, and if you start hearing, oh, I wanna take care of these freckles, or I go here, I get Fraxel, or I'm doing X, or I'm doing Y, you're like, you need to make sure that whatever you are treating, I've had an opportunity to look at. Mm -hmm. And if something is resistant, I wanna see it. Mm -hmm. Because maybe I didn't see it, you know, like it may not have evolved yet, but that doesn't mean that I've looked at it, now go erase it. I need to be part of this picture. And the worst is what if they are succeeding in erasing it because the mm -hmm. tumor is regressing, that's even scarier, right? So we want to make sure we're the proper gatekeepers, mm -hmm. keeping everybody healthy and well, and we sleep better and our patients do great. Now that's good advice. All right, one more question about high resolution ultrasound. Yes. So how might this benefit somebody who's debating, you know, do I want a sentinel lymph node biopsy, do I need it? So I think for sentinel lymph node biopsy, it does become, you know, a, it, it's, it's, there are very specific guidelines as to whether you get the biopsy based on staging. Mm -hmm. And then if you're not sure, like if they're in that intermediary category or there's clear contraindications, that's where it becomes helpful to, um, to perhaps do genetic expro expression profile testing, not the sticker, but the mm -hmm. testing on the tissue. But it's the fact that 88% of negative sentinel lymph node biopsies patients end up dying from melanoma, yeah. that the, it's more the question of the, the uh, stage 3C or mm -hmm. patients that are deciding, do I need to have complete resection of all of my lymph nodes? And that becomes mm -hmm. a lot of comorbidity involved in that, right? Because that's, that's a big procedure. That's where pe people are opting for high resolution ultrasound imaging to look for in transit nodal metastases, perhaps to help guide how important it is to do further dissection of the lymph nodes. And in the future, maybe given that, you know, that 88% or two thirds of melanoma deaths are in sentinel lymph node negative patients, perhaps people will opt to look with high resolution mm -hmm. ultrasound to see if there are in transit nodal metastases, even if the yeah. sentinel node is negative. And so that's where I think it becomes a really helpful um, additional non-invasive mm -hmm. tool. 
And you'll probably have an entirely different lecture next year based on new data and new I things think, coming out. I think that's 100% accurate. Um, I think that if our lectures look the same each year and yeah. we're dealing with cancer, um, we may not be doing it right. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Markowitz. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hope Cook with DermCast Live.